It's great to see everybody here and to be back here for the second week of what I think is going to be a, a very, very exciting journey. Uh, I met Richard some years ago. Uh, he had just published his book on story, uh, and I made it a requirement for all my graduate students to read that book. Uh, I then discovered that Richard is a rather prolific writer <laughs> on uh, myth, story, human nature, and the way it relates to the imagination. And my particular interest in realizing story has a lot to do, I think, with my own disabilities as a person. That is, that I like to see the world and capture it and then rethink about it before I say a lot about it. So I am not a prolific writer. Um, but I do have a rather large body of oeuvre that uh, span documentary film, some fiction film, some early work with video on the web, some later work with video on the web, and these environments that I'll be talking a little bit about tonight, which are um, It's a type of expression where there's not a lot of history. As in painting, you have a lot of history, so you can refer back and say, so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did this. And, uh, um, these kinds of environments are really one-offs today. They're really designed for particular situations. And one learns a little bit, one makes a premise when one starts one and uh, by making the work, you understand a little bit better, I think, the role of modern communication, that is digital and networked and interactive, and our storied selves or our embodied imaginations that allow us to understand the world through story. And I think Richard started this course in a great way last week with a set of paintings and a set of text stories that um, are very formative in most of our imaginations in terms of surprise, fear, and acceptance uh, when he talks about Abraham and Sarah, when he talked about uh, Mary, <laughs> the Annunciation, and uh, finally Mohammed. Uh, these are stories that allow us to better understand our own reactions and uh, actions in the world. And as he noted, they are uh, one way of interpreting them has to do a lot with hospitality. So. Um, Richard, uh, when Richard asked me to be part of this course, Richard sort of set me a wager, which was not entirely, um, I would say, it wasn't a narrow uh, uh, interaction just about hospitality. It was to ask if I could become part of this to think with him about something very, that will be a very specific aspect of a set of performances he wants to do all around the world uh, that have to do with the five wisdom traditions or are set in locuses of each of the wisdom traditions, I should say, and which uh, his hope is by uh, taking this idea of the performance and the idea of this course to all those different locuses and uh, participating with these different wisdom traditions, we will become closer to understanding uh, how we might move forward in a more peaceful world. Uh, with the assumption, I think, that uh, religious, religious belief very often is a barrier, is the, is, is creates the situation of the stranger. Um, and the stranger that's, in fact, rejected in a war situation. So uh, the specific wager that Richard has set up for me is to create a space, set of objects, something we're calling a guest box, 
that can provide an invitation, and the invitation is critical to what I, a critical portion of a transformational environment to me, and provide historical continuity for the guest book project as it travels. And so this thing might have some elements. It might have an actual guest book that we're familiar with, you know. Um, if you go to somebody's house, very often when you leave, you sign a guest book. Uh, when you go to a wedding or a funeral, as Brian reminded me today, very often the guest book is just in some place and you sign it so that people can know who was there. Um, in one of the performances that we'll talk a little bit about, the idea has been to have vials of water from different major rivers of the world that will again travel to each of the locuses of the performance or perhaps a flower that does something, an interactive flower. Um, part of the wager is to connect this uh, set of objects or this space to our story itself. So the idea of the performance is, is that there is an embedded story as the performance, as the the visitors to the performance move through the performance space and that when you leave the performance space you have had this experience of story that allows you to change a little. And I think last week we talked a very interesting thing about uh, when you go by a homeless person on the street or when Jehovah's Witness comes to your door what changes your attitude between saying, I'm shutting that door right now, I'm not going to hear a word, to hearing a little bit, or perhaps pausing not only to put some money in a cup, but maybe to find out, can you help the person? My father, we lived in a uh, brownstone in New York. I grew up in a brownstone in New York. My father was a journalist and uh, the brownstone was on the wrong side of the L at the time he built it and there was a bar on every corner and I remember my father saying well you don't just give this handout money to these beggars who are on the street. You must take them around the corner and give them a bowl of soup. Well, of course, I was fine for my father. It was not okay for us <laughs> as young children to do that, as my mother made very <laughs> clear. But, um, and then the, the, the third part of this wager is to ensure that the symbolism of the entire project, as well as the history of the project, are readable as they are contained in a box, unpacked and laid out and situated in the larger space of each performance. So um, at Glenstall, which again we'll go back to very toward the end of this talk, uh, there's this notion that there's a journey that starts in a church and then it goes into a very beautiful type of labyrinth in the woods and that maybe the five wisdom traditions meet uh, uh, in passage through that labyrinth and then perhaps one goes up to the top of the mountain uh, to a monastery where one has a very explicit uh, engagement with this guest book and with the history. And I say explicit engagement because you want the interaction to be consequent. You want, whenever you have an interactive, whenever you make an interactive piece, let's say you play a game uh, and you make an action, if it doesn't change the state of the world, who cares? You don't. You're just, you're just hitting a little uh, you know, mouse, clicking a little mouse, and you're not really feeling that you, know, you made the war worse or better, or you got to the next level of knowledge, or you didn't. Or you, so, in designing any kind of interaction, I think you have to feel that when the person, or if you're a poet and you're giving a recital, or you're me giving a lecture, I want you to leave this room as a different person than you were when you came into the room. And that when we make something like a theatrical thing, we have to be thinking about that. 
So this is my last slide on the guest box until the very end. Uh, but I wanted to just say that in my thinking about this, I think that there are sort of five elements for the box itself. It must contain an invitation that is for what the contents of it are and how the contents work. There has to be an invitation to the public to participate. That might be just around the book, or that might be, in a larger sense, the box itself. And that has to do with how, imagination, how our imagination grows the box. It has to be robust and multicultural. That is, for any place that the box travels, uh, it should be welcoming to that culture. And that may be an issue of language. It will certainly be an issue of imagery. Um, it should act as a memory vessel for the project. And again, you know, the guest book is part of that. These are the people who participated. But it also is the history of this lecture, this seminar. It is the poetry from the Poetry Day. It is the, you know, all the different aspects of what we're doing here. And um, it should contain somehow, it should speak to the presence of each participant um, in my head right now, I'm thinking of a sort of a collective signature that grows that is not as specific as a signature, uh, a separate signature for each person. But um, the input would certainly be separate for each person. And then it has to be threaded into each performance journey. So it has to, if, if it weighs, I'm going to give this example, if it weighs two tons, it will be very difficult to carry it by hand through a journey. On the other hand, maybe that's the interest of it, that you have to figure out how to carry it through the whole thing. I don't know. I know very little about what this box is going to be. But I hope the following works will help us a little bit uh, better understand what the potential is. And Last week, there was a question about technology. Why is technology associated with this project? I hope a little bit what I'm going to show you will suggest that technology is what you want to make it. There's a lot of potential, but it isn't one thing. So um, I want to just talk quickly about a term that Ricky Leacock gave the sort of performances that we're interested in making. Uh, he thought about opera in the largest sense of the word. And that is the light, the sound, the smell, the excitement, the energy, but not necessarily the proscenium. So two examples when I was working with Ricky that came to mind to just throw out here, and I don't have the last pictures of them. We were working with Rick, uh, Peter Sellers, who is about to give a presentation at the MFA in a couple of weeks, who's a very, very wonderful director. He was at the ART for a long time, and then he went to Washington to the performance box in Washington. And we were talking about Aristophanes, the birds, and we were just brainstorming. Why couldn't you use a laser to image a bird onto a player's shoulder so the bird, very bright, not really like a bird at all, but just light walking up the shoulder of the player as the player walks across the stage? There's no reason you can't do that very bright, in motion, following a character. It takes a lot of technique to do it. But if that's going to make the audience open their eyes and feel what's going on, it's worth it. Um, another uh, uh, piece we did was uh, we worked quite a bit with Sarah Caldwell in productions of the Opera Company of Boston. As Ricky said, Sarah always would ask us to do impossible things, and she never had any money. So we were always doing impossible things with no money. Um, in 1982, she put on a production of Die Soldaten. The composer was Bernd Zimmermann. 
It was the first time who died very young. It, 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 it's an opera where every aspect of how the orchestra is acting and how the players are acting is detailed, unbelievable detail. Um, it had never been performed in the United States, so it was a first performance. And there's a rape scene in the fourth act, um, very late. And uh, the woman has been sort of untrue to her lover. And so there is a projection of the rape scene uh, detailed by Mr. Zimmerman uh, that is going to be projected in the middle of the scene. Uh, three screens. And uh, I can't remember exactly the, the, specific, the specifics of it, but it was very graphic. And uh, we made it exactly as the composer detailed. We took it in. We climbed the 200 steps up to where the projectors were. We put the three reels of film on the projectors in rehearsal, showed them on the screen, <coughs> and Sarah called us down. She was very formidable. I don't know if any of you know, but she was an extremely formidable woman. Um, and she said, now, Ricky, you have done exactly what the composer asked you to do, and it doesn't work. Go back and do it your way. And we had 24 hours to recut. We had shot the rape scene in a way that would not show a single human figure. And what we finally showed was on three screens, the woman running, the struggle, and the you know horrendous sort of ending and leaving of her, where you never saw the woman, you never saw the soldier, because once you get too specific, sometimes you lose the imagination uh, that the audience, of the audience to be able to interpret with this incredibly powerful music what was going on and to have an empathy that connects with their own experience. So you, it, it's, it's a funny thing. So I wanted to mention that before I go on. Now, I'm going to show uh, one, two, three, four, five. Five works. Most of this will be taken up by a 15-minute film of the first piece I'm going to show. And the others are really quite short. I hope the first film won't bore you, but I don't think it will. Um, the Wheel of Life, an interactive transformational environment. Uh, we built it with a class of students in 1992, in the fall of 1992. I had to raise quite a bit of money for it. In, while it was happening, because it kept getting grander and grander. Um, at the time, the Media Lab, has any, have any of you been to the Media Lab? OK. Um, it was new. We moved in in 85. And one of the specifications we gave when the lab was being built is we wanted a performance space for opera in the largest sense of the word. And we got a box theater. That box theater was 60 by 60 by 50 feet high. Uh, many of these rooms would fit into that box. Not sure exactly how many, but I would say about four, and then you could stack it up about, you know, four or five. Um, it was fabulous. We didn't get any equipment because the equipment was very expensive. So they built this expensive building and they had moved everybody in and they networked the whole thing, but don't put any resources to anything that you could do in this beautiful box. So today, that box doesn't really exist anymore. It's been, uh, the floors have been filled in with laboratories and it's just sort of a little bit of it is two stories high as opposed to four stories high. Um, but, for us, it was a magnificent place to work. I had the Larry Friedlander, who was a colleague. I knew some of the work he'd done. I was very interested in it, in particular his work in learning systems for children. He's a Shakespearean actor by training. He was on the English department at Stanford. And he was coming 
to MIT for his sabbatical. And I went out to San Francisco and I met with him and I said, Larry, I have this idea for this just amazing piece that we're going to do in this space. I don't have any money, but you're going to be on sabbatical at MIT. How about you work with me on it a little bit, sort of, you know, what we're doing here. It's the fun thing about academia. And he agreed and we then had a very intense time before the, the, the thing kind of happened because I had a course called Workshop in Elastic Movie Time. And I did a big project every year, but this was super scale. Um, and uh, uh, we talked a lot about, we first thought explorers and guides. There had been a lot of talk at the time about making uh, uh, computer-based guides for people using computers. And I thought, well, that's really odd. We don't even know what a guide in the real world does. So let's do a piece where we have explorers and guides and see what a guide could do. And then we thought about, uh, well, wh how would we hang the narrative and how could we break the students into groups of, into, into four groups so it was manageable and each one of them could have some ownership over the content. And we came up with the idea of using a mandala. And I gave you the reading of the sacred architectures that I'll come back to at the end, but the mandala is the basis for this. In the mandala, there are sort of four elements, water, earth, air, and fire. We did water, earth, air. We did not do fire. And fire is perhaps the closest to the guest book that we have. Our idea for fire was that when you came into this project, and you'll see people coming in, we would take little snapshots of you. And then those would go into a big processing something or other. Um, and at the end, as you left, there would be fire, not as in conflagration, but of course it is also that, but where the heat of the fire would send all the visitors who had been through this project up into the sky and that it would be a very rich imagery for you to go out with. We ran out of steam uh, and we ran out of money. But we really ran out of steam. We didn't have the bandwidth, and you'll see why as soon as I show you this piece. So. In January 1993, we opened an experimental installation. The Wheel of Life draws its techniques from the worlds of theater, architectural design, cinema, and interactive computing to create a transformational space, one that is magically responsive to our presence and our every action. This work aims to promote a theoretical and practical understanding of interactive media environments and to demonstrate how new technologies may enhance communication between people. studying Tibetan Buddhism, that they have mm -hmm. mandalas, which are these sort of pictures right. of, yeah. of a cosmic space. And each part of the mandala, the mandala is a circle and it has these sections in it. And each section represents a different element of the world, but it also represents a different part of the body, a different part of person's psychology, a different spiritual stage. Oh, that. So it's all these elements packed together. And I thought mm -hmm. it'd be great if, if we could get people to collaborate on an area that would have all these packed different meanings. And that's what we did. We just told the groups that they could take one element and to define a whole series of things, you know, so that water is not only about water, it's about primitive life and about childhood and fantasy and dream, while earth is more about the, the process of growth and dissolution and of time and decay. And air is about aspiration and technique and reason and fire is about transcending. 
and then let people really work on that and find find um, their own you know out of the collaboration find their own um, energy and their own uh, ideas about it and uh, you know so we've come up with all kinds of things that I never would have dreamt of before and it's been you know, incredible that it's it's recognizable what we started with, but it's also surprising, which is exactly what I wanted. The workshop began in September 1992. Three groups were formed, each responsible for one environment. Visitors would encounter this environment in pairs of two. The explorer, who would move through the space, and the guide, who's sitting at a computer. The explorer comes in, it's dark, and uh, by light or sound, they're led into the center of the room. And uh, at this point, they're showing a video of themselves being thrown into a fishbowl. There's a big splash. And then the lights come up and the sound comes up and they find themselves in this underwater world that's uh, the feelings of being underwater enhanced by this reflections off the top by lighting, by mylar, by scrim, by uh, audio, that sort of thing. Um, so we're going to have this computer generated um, 3D image of this space that needs to be built up. So this corresponds to this space. Um, as, the, as the explorer moves around the room by triggering specific pressure plates in some sort of pattern that will um, generates, let's say, the base, the foundation for this space. And then, uh, given that he moves around and gets a couple of other pressure plates or some other kind of sensor, mm -hmm. then the, you know, couple lines which correspond to the columns will be generated. So the idea is that, um, you know, the space gets built up depending on the actions of the exploring side. But every color has an associated length with it and that they're trying to get the monkey to be able to run across uh, to the island in a straight path. So you know that you have to line up all of the logs at one time. And basically they're told that there's a second player down here that you can't directly control, but who's also trying to get his monkey across. And, but all, the, all that you know is that they're slower somehow and they have uh, trouble understanding the game. And by clicking on their colors, you're merely suggesting to them somehow to take that action, to, to launch that log. So they're encouraged to try to learn what the best order is. So what's happening inside the, the, the ship? The okay, inside the ship, this is like, if you just look at this half, you yeah. see here's the person mm -hmm. walking around. They step in front of that character, and a monitor comes on. So basically, this is just to show what it would right, but, it, look but like. what, what effect do the, the choice of these lines? Oh, I'm sorry. Have That's the one thing that I haven't incorporated into this. When you click on this, this should turn on a flashing light. I think behind the mylar, near the monitor. So basically, and it's like a radio button. I think um, only one would be active at a time. After three months of design and media development, construction began in the Villers Experimental Media Facility, a space 60 foot square. This turns out to be the world's most expensive shower curtain. Yeah, because they had a minimum order. Why is it more work to do the more? Are they button switches? that you always have wet paint on set when you open. Yep. It's good luck. They do. Well, Planning it's not good luck. That. It's just normal. <laughs> okay. The installation was open to the public for 10 days in January 1993. Yeah, and here is to use your voice, your body, your emotion to affect the stories around you, much more like a computer interaction. And so I'll use the term interactive. In each space, and there are three, they go in order water, 
earth and air, which are provided by an element and sort of ideas which embody that element. Who's talking to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't get and that. That's if you know that, and you say, "Oh, here's this whale. I have to listen to what it's saying to me." legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip Hey! It is the dawn of a new day. Go to the arch, listen to the four winds, and step in the right direction. Arch. Okay. This is the arch. Step door. Step in the right direction. Step door. Anything more? Okay, this is it's the right direction. Right direction. Wait, the right. The right. The right. Wait. The right from what way? Right. Slow down. It's in the east, and Juliet is the sun. Oh, look. Where's east? East, east, east. West, east. North. That's north. So this is east. Aren't showing. This is That's east. why. Oh, no, no, this is why. This is south. Northeast. Swallow, west. flying, flying south. Fly to her. Fly south. 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 Okay, um. No, north, south. Okay, this is it. I know, but it didn't work. That's what I pressed. I am as constant as the northern star. Uh. North. Try it again. Now let go. The lights are on. Good for you. You have completed your journey through my land. Go seek another journey in the galaxies beyond. seems to build as you start kind of in the water. This is all kind of exploratory 
more touch feel kinds of things and then you go into the more conceptual air space of icons and images and that's earth you know, actually earth and then you move into space and that's Best. where you, we really started I think working as a team in space because we've gone through all the list and that's when of course we got most of it. So, two things. Very difficult to make a documentary about an experience. It, and if you're a little confused by it, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> it, we tried many times to cut the material, and this was sort of the best of what we could do, and then I made separate ones of each of the spaces. But what I, what I want to um, suggest is that there's an invitation in each case. Uh, the in invitation sets up the water space long before creatures walked, ran, slithered, or whatever. Um, and then you have that big fist. And it was a huge fist when you were actually in the fish, fish bowl. And it all of a sudden let the water out. And you have fish swimming around you. And you're in that world. And it's a very, uh, you talked about the wager as, as having these different layers and sort of being at one time, but not necessarily being at one time and some serial thing. I think in creating an experience, you have to give the person who comes to that experience some time. And you have to make that invitation magical enough so that they're there, they're in there. Um, particularly in a case where you're not going to the theater or opera, which you already know, you know what the model is for it. Now in this case, my original idea was that there would always be one explorer and one guide. But when we opened this, there was so many people wanted to come and there was such a huge line that we said, oh well, that went out the window and we sort of did three groups of three of each. And everybody <laughs> wanted to do both. So they wanted to do that, be the explorer and they wanted to be the guide. So, here we were, six people going through the whole thing twice, took a long time and everybody else was, I mean, we asked people to come on the hour, you know, it was a staged thing. But what it totally blew apart, which we didn't realize till after we set that first group through, is when you say, step in the right direction or even in water when you had fingers pointing to the whale to try to get people to go toward the whale or like this was easy, you know, they could figure out, okay, that's an ear. But you're pointing and you all of a sudden have three people. They're standing in different parts of the space and all of a sudden what you did for one perspective doesn't work. And um, so I think that that's another thing that we have to be very aware of, that there are going to be differences in the performance and how you make the invitation and how you make the interaction, you have to be very careful that many people will be able to interpret it the correct way, even under circumstances that you had no idea of. Um, so uh, I did just, uh, you know, Larry's exploration of sacred spaces, uh, the mandala being one of them. And uh, I just wanted to mention that in Sanskrit, mandala means the essence and having or containing. So in some sense, I think of this box could be a mandala, but maybe not. So we'll see as we go through uh, consideration of his different spaces. And uh, this shows you, I wanted to show that particular movie because I wanted to show a little bit how we work with students. We brainstorm through, we get some ideas, then people start to make sketches. Then we see what are the best sketches. We don't sort of preconceive what something's going to be because all ideas are good ideas in the beginning. And they just get sort of weeded out. And so what we're going to do later uh, today, shortly, is going to be doing a little brainstorming here about the guest box and the guest book. And so I want everybody to feel like that, that is the process. We don't know what it is. Um, 
So here we had made a little chart that took, for instance, what the symbolic elements were and how they related to psychology and how they related to space. And we gave those to the students and the students worked off of those. And you saw in their early presentations, none of them had built anything, by the way. The most surprising thing was it, when we were doing Earth and nobody had painted a set. You know, and people from MIT, these brainy kids from MIT, but building, I mean, we were building huge structures. We had a lighting grid that was hanging above everybody's head. I was praying that we didn't have an accident. I mean, it was heavy, it was big, and yet they jumped right in and figured it out. But a lot of the lessons from the Opera Company of Boston actually were useful, like projections on scrim are gorgeous. They're, they're very diaphanous, they're gorgeous. So now I'm gonna quickly go through uh, the remaining pieces. Uh, the Pigeons and Jay Shri, I will dance for you. I, I wanted to uh, explore, one of the things we did in Wheel of Life was we had this pairing and we had this notion of audience, but what if you just put projections out in the world and have them responsive to people who are going by. And can they elicit feeling? Can they be comic or can they be sad or insulting? Can they make you feel like you did an awful thing? Um, so I'll show these two will play back to back. a very special fun piece to make. The, the stage in that case was images drawn from the web, but it never really worked. So eventually those images got frozen. But you could, I mean, the idea was that as new images were being posted, we wanted the stage to be, uh, have a reflection of what was happening on, on the web itself. And this is 1996, uh, so it's early still. Um, so, uh, what else? Do I, oh, another a problem though. You know, so technology. You say, oh well, that's easy. You know, you did it. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided to do uh, sonar sensors because I wanted to get the idea of people passing by and this interruption. What we hadn't figured out. Well, what happened when three or ten people pass by as a group? 
And that was a, a very difficult ex, uh, issue because if uh, one person walks into the space, two people walk into the space, one person walks out of the space, there's still somebody in the space, how do you treat that? Or somebody walks into the space and then a second person walks into the space. Uh, you, you get into these sort of difficulties of not knowing when people, when, when nobody's in the space because you can't compute it. So you need something in addition to just the sonar sensors. We later that year did a piece called The Kids' Room where we had very, very sophisticated imaging technology looking down and we had a bunch of kids running around in the space uh, uh, getting their magical bureau to speak to them and the monster dance with the monster. And we could actually see everything that they were doing. The computer could see everything that they were doing and respond accordingly. But I'm, I'm sort of cheap. I mean, I don't like to have technology that's over the top. So I'm very interested in what is sort of the minimum technology you can use. Like in uh, air, the, the people who were the officers on the ship who were on the screens, they just had a little mat in front of that screen and it was an on-off switch. So when you stepped on the mat, somebody was looking at them trying to wake them up. It was a sort of a simple idea. Uh, okay. Uh, it was first uh, a, a jazz trio. So there were three bottles, and as you lifted up the bottle and put the cap, as you, as you took the cap off the bottle, it would open up and the instrument would play. And you could take the caps off in any order, and the jazz would just flow out of the bottles, which was beautiful. Uh, we tried to think about what kind of story we could put in there, and the idea was to put genies in a bottle. And so the rule was that when there's only one bottle open, the person is talking directly to you. When you have two bottles open, the two genies are talking together. When you have three bottles open, the, the genies are sort of all at war with each other. Um, but the nice thing about that technology is it's very simple. There's just an IR tag on the bottle, so the table knows when that bottle goes onto it. So it knows that that bottle is supposed to play the violin. And there's a, a gate at the top. When you take the stopper out, the gate is open, plays. When you put it back in, closes off. Simple, very difficult to do very elegantly. The last piece I'll just do very briefly, in 2001, we, uh, uh, a w guy who was coordinating a show for cyber arts in Boston had seen our, um, the pigeons piece. He was interested in my doing something like that for cyber arts. He gave me two rooms, which was a mistake. You know, if he'd have given me one room, I might have done the pigeons again. But it was two rooms, so I had to invent something new. Um, and my. I, I had this idea, I'd always wanted to do a table where people edited stories by moving blocks around. And um, I also had the idea that messages, when you make a message, you have a very different perception of what you're telling or saying than anybody does who hears that message. 
So, and I'm sure, you know, if you write a poem, you're in the poem in a certain way, and then when we hear it, we hear this music and we hear it, but it's very different. So I wanted to do a piece that sort of emphasized that. So we had two rooms. We had a forest of bird cages. In each of the bird cages, there was a bird, a peacock was walking. And if you open the cage, uh, the peacock flew away, and uh, a message would go into it that was an edited a piece of editing that people had done in the other room. In the other room, you had a table. It was like uh, there's a kid's game. When you're little, you can move these blocks around and make uh, words. So they made little movies. They got to see their movies. They even said, it's my movie. And when it went out of the editing room, we put a little piece of... The pockets are always full of leaves. In the winter, she sometimes takes a few out and freezes them outside the window pane of her room, trying to keep them alive until spring. So that's an edited piece. How that worked was the people in the room did the editing of the shots in order, and then when it went out into the queue, we had a stack of sound, and it just pulled one of the sound pieces out, and we had a wonderful, we had three wonderful voices reading these very sort of poetic pieces of sound and adding them to it. So that's the end of my, of the work I want to show, and hopefully we can use that to help inform as we start to think about the guest box and the guest book. Um, so uh, I just have a very few, uh, well, I have a few slides. I'm going to go back to a little bit of Larry Friedlander's work. But <clears throat> the guest box and the guest book, again, has to situate the participant in the world and reaffirm the paradox of the wager, in this case of, of Richard's original wager, which is the wager of the host and the stranger. It has to present a call to exploration and learning and expression. That is, if you want somebody to sign a book, you have to somehow invite them to do that, and it has to be meaningful at the end. They have to feel that it's meaningful. Um, I don't know if we can push it far enough, so there's that sort of comic response that you talk about, which has to do with the fear of accepting the wager, of being the friend, of becoming the friend. Um, uh, and then we have to deal with this multicultural issue it has to be robust and easy to set up, and it has to act as a memory vessel. And the memory vessel, I think, is, is a beautiful thing because when all of these recordings happen and all of the beautiful uh, work that are starting off each lecture, how do we display that in a way that somebody can, can understand or row with who comes to a performance that is outside of the, the weekly meetings. And um, as you could see from the film of The Wheel, this is not easy. Um, but I think we can do something. Um, just to remind you again of the sacred architecture, these are sort of tools, I think, that we have for a narrative. We have the idea of the mandala we've talked a little bit about. Um, Larry also talks about the body of God, the, the Eucharist. Uh, the World Tree, the, the last three, I have some slides, so we'll just look. The World Tree, this is a, I don't even know how you pronounce this. Yeah, Drossel? Okay. Um, and here you can see there's a serpent uh, in the root of the tree. The tree is growing up, and we have the uh, you know, heavens or bigger world above. Uh, Larry mentioned the Jack and the Beanstalk tale, which we all know, where uh, Jack is with his mother going to the market, and a stranger says to him, uh, I'll trade you these beans for a cow. 
And Jack takes him up on it, and his mother is furious, and his mother says, throw out those beans. And he throws them up, and a huge beanstalk grows up. And then, of course, Jack has to climb the beanstalk. And he climbs it three times. The third time, he's about to take the harp. The harp in this wonderful woodblock print by Walter Crane is hanging on for dear life to the tree uh, to not come down. And we all know that eventually it gets chopped down, and so on. Um, the labyrinth which uh, uh, is lovely. Um, in a labyrinth, you do not lose yourself, the lady told me at Grace Cathedral. In a labyrinth, you find yourself. And uh, I was actually in the San Francisco church that has that labyrinth. And uh, it is a very meditative experience, which is what I think my only point about this um, but there are wonderful, I mean, it's a very, very old form that goes back. Uh, and there's the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur and the ball of yarn eventually that allows the Theseus to find his way out of his, the, the Minotaur is kept in the center of the labyrinth and Theseus goes to slay the miniature, but then how does he get out? Um, the last of Larry's uh, sacred places is the tabernacle. And I, I think this is a reconstruction by Paul Volks um, of what it might have looked like. Uh, initially, when Richard and I were talking about the box, we thought about a silk tent. And I thought, in this tent, you might have two projectors, one projector going one way, showing the um, image of the signatures as it comes out, and the other going the other way, showing the historical bits. Um, but then I thought that this was such a beautiful image of a little thing after you talked about the water vessels and other things that I grabbed it from the web. And um, uh, this goes to the Hebrew word for to dwell, rest, or live in. I'm sure there are experts in the room who know far more about this than I do. But um, I thought it was interesting that in Wikipedia, the book of Exodus, uh, uh, they shall make me a sanctuary, and I will dwell among them. You must make the tabernacle, and its furnishings follow the plan that I am showing you. Um, so that's another sort of piece of uh, sacred place that is a nomadic sacred place. And what we're making is, in some sense, nomadic because it's going to many places. Um, this takes me to uh, just a word about Glenstall, which I'll then ask Richard and uh, Fanny to talk a little bit more about because they've thought a lot about what the journey might be in this um, performance. Uh, but there is the notion of a blessing, there is a garden which has a labyrinth in it, and then the idea is that the guest box and invitation and book would be toward the end, but there might be elements in the box that travel through the space. And uh, when we think about the guest book, we need to think about what's the input, what's the output, uh, how does it connect with other objects in the guest book, how does it connect to the historical records of the project. Um, oh, I'm going to not go into that. But one of the artist that I like a lot for this sort of thing is Mark Downey. He was a graduate of the Media Lab. And this I don't have in motion, by the way. But there, um, uh, Merce Cunningham, who's a quite a well-known 20th century dancer, uh, was filmed with sensors on his fingers and uh, his arms. And this print was made of his gesturing about a dance that he could no longer, he was no longer able to perform with his whole body. And Mark translated the data from these movements of his hands and arms into this just beautiful uh, uh, light painting. 
and the software that he built for that is uh, available now in open source and it might be something that we play with. Uh, so an idea for a signature might be a gestural signature as a po or Richard was thinking maybe even a handshake uh, that might not be a written signature or maybe we should also have a written signature because there's a lot of trade-offs here. Um, and I was thinking that it also might be nice to have a voice print that then got turned into some kind of chanting sound. So I don't know what it is. But out of, as I think the, the lesson of the methodology is, as you evolve, the inner workings of the performances will start to, and, and as each person who's expert in their own wisdom tradition has ideas about what objects might be, uh, might be symbolic of this sort of larger world peace idea, uh, that then we'll start to sort through those ideas and we'll come to some kind of understanding of what we have to make. And in the meantime, we'll prototype different things. I mean, we can, you know, leave here tonight and prototype something by next week. It's not uh, sort of how we work. So.